Hello. I'd like to spend some time today reflecting with you on the parable of the Good Samaritan. In particular, what it means to be neighbor. What it means to be neighbor to those in need of assistance. Before we take a look at the parable, I'd like you to stop and think about some human tragedies you've seen reported in the news in recent months. Whether tornadoes or bombings or mass shootings or floods, collapsed buildings, train wrecks, plane wrecks, whatever. There's no shortage of these incidents. Think about what you've seen in these reports. You've probably seen people running away from the scene and some people running to the scene. What's the difference? What accounts for the fact that some run away and some run to in order to help. Instinct may account for some of this, but for others, I believe it's more than instinct. I believe it has something to do with traits of character, with possessing a heart which sees. But before going any further, let's take a listen to the parable. But the man was anxious to justify himself and said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was once on his way down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of brigands. They stripped him, beat him, and then made off, leaving him half dead. Now a priest happened to be traveling down the same road. But when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite who came to the place saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion. He went up and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. He then lifted him onto his own mount and carried him to the inn and looked after him. Next day, he took out two denarii and handed them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and on my way back, I will make good any extra expense you have. So which of these three do you think proved himself a neighbor to the man who fell into the brigand's hands? The one who took pity on him, the lawyer replied. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same yourself. So what was it about the Samaritan that led him to do what he did? Two other individuals also saw the battered and bloodied stranger along the roadside, and they walked right by. Why? What was it about them? Two recent popes have begun to suggest an answer to these questions. Pope Benedict XVI in his encyclical, God is Love, and Pope John Paul II. Benedict says, the Christian program, the program of the Good Samaritan, the program of Jesus is a heart which sees. This heart sees where love is needed and acts accordingly. Note here that Benedict identifies the parable of the Good Samaritan with the mission of Jesus and with the heart of the gospel. They are all identical. That is critical for understanding the importance of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And John Paul II, in his apostolic letter on suffering, says this, Therefore, one must cultivate this sensitivity of heart. Here we come to the enormous importance of having the right attitudes. The eloquence of the parable of the Good Samaritan and of the whole gospel is especially this. Every individual must feel as if called personally to bear witness to love in suffering. The institutions are very important and indispensable. Nevertheless, no institution can by itself 
replace the human heart. When it is a question of dealing with the sufferings of another. Now, the parable of the Good Samaritan is a grounding story for Catholic health care. It is the gospel basis for what we do, the gospel basis for our mission of compassionate healing, of carrying on the healing mission of Jesus. But when we reflect on the parable of the Good Samaritan, we tend to focus on Jesus' injunction to go and do likewise. We tend to focus on acting like the Good Samaritan. What we most often don't pay attention to is why the Good Samaritan did what he did. What kind of person was he that he was not able to just pass by on the other side? What character traits or dispositions or virtues led him to respond as he did? This is what I'd like to explore. What kinds of people and organizations ought we be in order to be neighbor to others? Now, both Benedict and John Paul II begin to answer this by pointing to the human heart, the core of the person, the locus of deep-seated love. But what are the particular aspects or dimensions of a heart which sees? Let's take some time to explore that because identifying these character traits is the first step in acquiring them or strengthening them. I'm going to depend here to a large degree on the work of a Catholic moral theologian, William Spohn, in his book, Go and Do Likewise. So what enables the Samaritan to see and respond? The parable tells us he was moved with compassion. The heart sees because it is filled with compassion. That's the first thing. It is filled with compassion, which is simply a receptivity to the suffering of another. It's an openness to the suffering of another. Spohn says in his book, compassion is the optic nerve of Christian vision. Without an optic nerve, we don't see. Without compassion, the Christian vision can never be enacted. Compassion is core to living out the gospel. But what else? What else besides compassion? Spohn tells us that compassion leads to empathy. And by empathy, he means feeling with and feeling into the situation, not just being open to the suffering of another, but being able to enter into that suffering, identifying with the experience of others or the problem or the chaos of the situation. And empathy leads to effective action. So that compassion leads to empathy. Empathy leads to responding appropriately to the immediate needs of the other and to caring for future needs as well. It's a compassion without boundaries. Notice that in the parable, Jesus never answers the question, who is my neighbor? We cannot delimit who the neighbor is. The neighbor is whoever is in need, whoever we come across in need. Jesus stretches the limits of who is neighbor and who are the subjects or the objects of our compassion. Compassion is without boundaries. Now, John Paul II says something fairly similar to this. He says in his apostolic letter, the name Good Samaritan fits every individual who is sensitive to the sufferings of others. Therefore, one must cultivate the sensitivity of heart which bears witness to compassion towards a suffering person. Cultivate this sensitivity of heart. So sensitivity of heart and compassion make possible a number of other things. He says, first of all, they make possible stopping. Not stopping to gawk, but stopping to respond. Not stopping out of curiosity, 
but stopping out of availability, an opening of oneself to the other and a giving of oneself to the other. He says a good Samaritan is the person capable of a gift of self, opening the person's eye to the other person. And availability to the other is in order to bring help, that effective action, to the other. A good Samaritan, he says, is one who brings help in suffering, whatever its nature may be, help which is effective. In addition to what Spohn tells us and what John Paul II tells us, we can add two other virtues or dispositions. Courage. The Samaritan put his life at risk. He could have suffered the very same fate as the individual on the side of the road. He could have suffered further ostracization by Jews and by his own community because he touched the individual on the side of the road who was covered with blood. Therefore, he was unclean. He could have been ostracized. And he could have been ostracized for caring for someone who is viewed as an enemy. Courage is critical to being neighbor. When we think of those human tragedies and people running toward those tragedies, there's an element of courage that is required to do that because they don't know what lies ahead. They don't know the danger in which they're putting themselves. In addition to courage, we can talk about hospitality. The Samaritan is a prime example of hospitality. He offered assistance to the person on the side of the road in a welcoming, respectful, non-judgmental way. He gave of his own resources, and that is hospitality, of oil and wine and money. And he did this to provide for the needs of this other person who was in need. An attitude of hospitality, a disposition toward hospitality, is critical to a heart which sees. The parable of the Good Samaritan calls us to deep reflection about our own moral perception as individuals and as organizations. Do we have a heart which sees? Where are our moral blind spots? Do we suffer from moral blindness? Are there certain types of people and certain types of situations or problems that we choose not to see? The parable actually calls us to more than self-reflection. It calls us to conversion. Conversion, Spohn tells us, requires confronting our blindness and our reluctance to be engaged with people who are threatening or repulsive. Correcting our moral blindness requires rectifying the heart's dispositions. And that is the work of conversion, the work of transformation. So, in sum, what does the parable of the Good Samaritan teach us about what is required to be a neighbor to others, to have a heart which sees? Compassion, being receptive or sensitive to the sufferings of others, stopping. Empathy, a solidarity with the other and entering into the other's misfortune. The ability to give oneself, moving toward effective action that helps. A compassion without boundaries. Courage, the willingness to put one's own self at risk. Hospitality, giving of one's resources. And finally, conversion, the willingness to deal with our own moral blind spots. Those dispositions of heart which prevent our heart from seeing as it should. But are these dispositions and virtues enough in today's world? especially in the world of healthcare. Let's take a look at a different version of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I've taken this from the work of theologian Jack Glazer in his book, The Three Realms of Ethics. Jack begins with the parable as we heard it earlier. And then he goes on and he says, as the Samaritan traveled further, He came upon another man who had been beaten and needed care. He likewise ministered to him and set him on his mount. 
As the three turned the next bend in the road, the Samaritan's heart sank, for there were two more figures lying on the side of the road in the foreground, and further, before the road turned in the distance, he made out one further traveler, struck to the ground and needing help. His heart was filled with pity and compassion, but with growing distress, for his resources would be exhausted long before he reached the last person in his view. And he could only guess at what lay around the next bend. Protestant theologian Alan Verhey has an essay in which he deals with the parable of the Good Samaritan in a situation of limits. And so I want to draw upon his work for the remainder of our reflection on the parable. Verhey says this, he says, the Good Samaritan no longer seems quite so apt an image for the care of those who hurt. And the reason is simple. The Samaritan did not face the issue health care is forced to face today, the issue of scarcity. The limitless compassion of the Samaritan makes his story seem more odd than exemplary. Unlimited care seems not a real option. And he says elsewhere, can we continue to tell this story of the Good Samaritan as an image of care for those who hurt and acknowledge the limits of our resources? Can we still be Good Samaritans in the midst of tragic choices imposed by scarcity? So given the fact of limits and scarcity, within our world and within healthcare, what other dispositions or virtues or attitudes need to be part of the character of the Good Samaritan? To be good, the contemporary Samaritan requires virtues besides compassion. What might they be? Verhey suggests several. First of all, an attitude that acknowledges scarcity and limits. We simply do not have the resources to do all we can do or all that we want to do for all who hurt. It simply is not possible. And so rather than go on and pretend that we don't have these limits, we need to develop the capacity the disposition to acknowledge, in fact, there are limits. And because there are limits, we need to acknowledge the fact of tragedy. We need to acknowledge the fact that there will have to be very difficult choices, some of which will be tragic choices, some of which will leave people hurting, some of which will leave people harmed. A heart that sees is also a heart that acknowledges the fact of tragedy and has remorse over that tragedy. We need the virtue of truthfulness to acknowledge the fact of tragedy, to say, yes, this in fact is not what we want, but it's all that we can do, or it's the best that we can do, given our situation, and not pretend that tragedy is not occurring. We need humility, humility to recognize that we are finite and that we are dealing with limits, that we are dealing with finitude. Humility to be able to recognize that in the end, only God's grace will overcome suffering and death and pain and disease. We cannot do it. Only God will be the ultimate victor. And finally, gratitude. Gratitude that there is something that we can do. Gratitude that we can exercise compassion. Gratitude that we can do good to heal hurt. But we can't do everything. Verhey goes on and says we also need justice in this situation. He says, the Samaritan will never be good without compassion, but let it be said again, the contemporary Samaritan will never be good with just compassion. 
The contemporary Samaritan cannot be good with only compassion, but just compassion is indeed required. The virtue of justice is essential to those who would be good in the midst of scarcity. Justice to make sure that the tragic decisions that are made, the allocation decisions that are made, are done in a way that is just and fair and transparent. And with this goes an attitude of concern for public policy, public policy that does justice, public policy that attempts to address the social situations that lead to the harm of people in our society. Again, to quote Verhe, the very compassion that moved the Samaritan to care for one who hurt would motivate attention to policy when many hurt, so that policy alleviates the hurt inflicted on so many members of our society. And at times what's needed, what a heart that sees needs is a prophetic voice against injustice. Raising our voice and naming injustice and naming those who perpetuate injustice. And finally, and very importantly, Verhey says that we need to develop an attitude that is contrary to the conceit of philanthropy. The conceit of philanthropy is a problematic attitude where we see that we are the worthy benefactors and they are the needy beneficiaries. Instead of that, Verhey says, the Samaritan gives no hint of the conceit of philanthropy. He shares the suffering. He sees the wounded man not only as the needy beneficiary, but as a neighbor, a member of a community that includes the sick. The story is the story of living in a community that shares the human vulnerability to suffering and communally supports care for the members of the community. That is the proper attitude toward those to whom we provide assistance. So, in sum, while we are called to do likewise, we are also called to be neighbor, to possess a heart which sees. And that always occurs in a context, a context of human finitude, a context of limited resources. We simply are unable as good Samaritans, to do all that we can do and that love wants to do because of limits. So in addition to developing character traits or virtues that enable us as individuals and organizations to be neighbor, we also need to develop those virtues that enable us as individuals and organizations to be neighbor in the midst of limits and tragic choices. Now, I said before that the parable of the Good Samaritan is a grounding story for Catholic health care. At the heart of what we do is being neighbor. And so it's important that from time to time we return to all our grounding stories, but certainly this grounding story. Why? Because it reminds us of who we are called to be. It inspires us to recommit ourselves and it motivates us to bridge the gap and address our moral blind spots. It motivates us to conversion. Russ Connors and Patrick McCormick, two Catholic moral theologians say, in the stories we choose to attend to and believe in and repeat to others, we are expressing and shaping ourselves as persons and as communities. And the parable of the Good Samaritan is one of those stories. And so we return to the story of the Good Samaritan. We're reminded that we must show compassion to those in need, regardless of who they are, and exercise effective action. But we miss something extraordinarily important if our focus is solely on doing, 
on solely acting like the Good Samaritan. The parable calls us to be the kind of person who is neighbor to others, to develop a heart which sees, and to develop those traits, those dispositions, those virtues, which enable us to be like the Good Samaritan and to go and do likewise. This is not optional. It's not optional for disciples or for those who carry on Jesus' healing mission. It's core to the identity of Catholic health care and those who are part of Catholic health care. But being neighbor is difficult. It's a challenge because of our individual and organizational moral blind spots. Because our hearts do not see or do not always see clearly. Because our sensitivity of heart is not as unencumbered or expansive as it should be. So being neighbor requires attention and effort and practice at both the individual and organizational levels. Being neighbor invites us to look at ourselves and our experience individually and collectively and identify where our seeing is inadequate and why. It requires ongoing growth and conversion, and this is the work of mission and formation. At stake in all of this is ultimately our identity and our integrity. Are we willing to have a heart that sees? Are we willing to respond to the injunction of Jesus to go and do likewise? I'd like to suggest a few questions for reflection and discussion. Who are the persons in need of urgent care today in our communities? What are the ways in which we individually and collectively are blind to or avoid the obvious need of some persons? Second, in what ways, if any, does the conceit of philanthropy infect our responses to those in need? Third, how do we personally and collectively or institutionally deal with limits, the limits of finitude and the limits of resources? Fourth, where is conversion needed in us as individuals and in our organizations with regard to being neighbor? And finally, what can be done personally and institutionally to cultivate and strengthen the character traits needed to effectively be neighbor. Thank you.